Next up, we have Senator Jerry Moran. Uh, after, seven, after serving seven terms in the United States House of Representatives, uh, Kansas elected Jerry Moran to the United States Senate in 2010. Since joining the U.S. Senate, Senator Moran has emerged as a leader in technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation policy. Senator Moran is the author of the Startup Act and the Startup 2.0 Act. This uh, bill seeks to find a solution in the high-skilled immigration reform issue and tax code reform to help and encourage startup investment. Senator Moran was also a key challenger along with Senator Ron Wyden to the Protect IP Act because of his concerns about how the legislation may have impacted technical functions on the internet infrastructure and possibly implications on innovation, free speech, and national security. Senator Moran has also been an active in encouraging Congress to develop smart spectrum policy. He's also a fan of technology forums. He's been to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. He's been at CES promoting legislation and meeting young entrepreneurs and startup companies. And if you, I don't know if you went this year, maybe you can tell us about some of the things he saw. But this is his first visit to State of the Net, so please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I'm I take that as a warm welcome because I just walked over from uh, Russell. It is uh, terrible out. Even for a Kansan, it's uh, very cold here. Uh, I am delighted to, to make my debut appearance uh, before the Internet Caucus and uh, appreciate the opportunity to express a few views. Uh, I asked Tim what he would like for me to speak about, and he suggested that I talk about the, the, the forest, not the trees, that we need the big picture about why this, uh, the issues that you care about uh, many that uh, Anna uh, explained and, and talked about uh, were important in a broader sense, and I was very pleased because uh, I, I have an idea about the forest. The trees are much more difficult for me, and I'm glad that, that the expertise in this room that uh, helps me understand uh, the trees and how they fit into that forest. But uh, this, is a, this is a very important topic for me, and uh, it is uh, something that uh, I am w was slow to understand and slow to appreciate, uh, but very much interested in being fully engaged uh, in the issues that, uh, that you all care about and, and that uh, Anna and others will talk about during your conference. Um, I've tried to learn about technology, and uh, this issue comes to me in a different fashion perhaps than most. Um, I got interested in the issues of the internet and technology and innovation as a result of my discouragement by what little evidence I saw that Congress and the President were going to work together to do anything to solve our country's fiscal problems. Um, every piece of evidence that I've seen in my two years that I've been a United States Senator suggests that uh, we're not yet serious about the fiscal condition of our country. And so then it became important for me to figure out is there a different way uh, in addition to the issue of the tax rates and the tax code, a different way in addition to levels of spending that we can help address our country's fiscal challenges. And it occurred to me that entrepreneurship, innovation, growing the economy, opportunity for economic growth is perhaps the, the best opportunity and uh, it's one that's a lot more enjoyable than having the daily battles about levels of spending and the amount of the tax rate. Uh, and at about that time that I got to reach that conclusion, the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City, the Kauffman Foundation for Entrepreneurship, issued its report about the state of entrepreneurship in the United States and, um, and made some specific policy recommendations about how to improve that uh, level of entrepreneurship and to create additional opportunities for startup companies. And so that caught my attention. And then I had the fortune of uh, Ron Wyden, Senator Wyden, uh, finding me on the Senate floor a, uh, uh, a little more than uh, a year ago, uh, asking for an ally, a Republican ally, in his battle in regard to uh, SOPA and PIPA. And um, with uh, kind of a day's worth of analysis and thought, it became clear to me that uh, while it is Congress's intent to do good things, in this case, Congress is going to create much more uh, problems, challenges, and in, from my perspective, uh, not only the issues of, of uh, freedom and, and privacy, but also the opportunity for companies to innovate without additional regulatory and uh, attacks upon their ability to do that. And so Senator Wyden and I became allies. We both filed a hold against the bill in the Senate uh, and 
made the commitment to, to bring in the cots, and while we're going to have a conversation this week about a talking filibuster, I can assure you that Senator Wyden in particular, but I'd be happy to join him in talking uh, our way through a filibuster on this topic. Uh, and while it was uh, a great opportunity to engage an issue and, and uh, create opportunities for me to get acquainted with people in Kansas and across the country that I otherwise would not have known, uh, I would assure you uh, I, that it is one that matters greatly to the country and one that we cannot afford to look the other way because the threat is not yet over. Uh, part of my experience in the, in, and, and while Senator Wyden and I are, are pleased to have provided a little leadership in this, what really happened was out in the community uh, where the difference was made. And uh, part of what I've been about in traveling to CES and to South by Southwest uh, to a visit with uh, entrepreneurs and startups uh, in other places across the country, including Kansas, is to see if there's not an opportunity for that community not just to be able to oppose something, but have the ability to support something. Uh, and is there a possibility that if we develop positive legislation that the uh, internet innovation technology apps community uh, appreciates, that they could provide the political support similar to the ability they showed in providing the political opposition. And so that uh, is um, something that uh, I, I think re remains to be seen, but something very important in the future of our democracy, uh, the United States of America, is what role will those who have the ability and interest in using uh, the internet, uh, will they be able to ut utilize, capture that uh, skill, uh, that talent, uh, and bring people together in support of issues that matter uh, to the country? Um, I think that the overriding forest here is my message to my colleagues in Congress would be do no harm. Uh, and again, uh, Sopa and Pippa were the highlight, highlighted for me the suggestion that we, even with good intentions, and uh, in that case significant political clout, um, the, the good intentions actually resulted in harm very damaging to the country. Um, I then uh, tried to, to take this issue uh, of innovation further than that. We got involved in an issue of spectrum, uh, additional spectrum for our country and its economy for innovators is terribly important. Um, I have an opportunity to try to influence uh, decisions at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I serve on the Senate Appropriations Committee and the ranking Republican and expect to continue that in the new uh, Congress, uh, the ranking Republican on the subcommittee that has uh, jurisdiction, the budget, and the appropriations process for the FCC, and we've worked hard at developing a relationship. Uh, I guess it wasn't that difficult. We've worked to develop a relationship with uh, Chairman Jenikowski and the other commissioners to see if we can't uh, at least have input into decisions and topics that the FCC uh, is uh, undertaking, including the significant need for additional spectrum. I've also served on the Homeland Security Committee, uh, where we've had an opportunity to try to fashion uh, legislation uh, designed to uh, protect ourselves from cybersecurity issues, but to do so in a way that uh, is not damaging to the innovative economy. And then finally, the, the results, uh, the, the suggestions, the policy views espoused by the Kauffman Foundation ended up in legislation that was indicated in my introduction. Uh, startup, uh, at the Startup Act followed by Startup 2.0, uh, and what that, the basis of that legislation is an understanding that uh, entrepreneurs, particularly those in technology, uh, have been the driving force behind the U.S. economy in our economic growth and expansion. Uh, and in, particularly in recent decades, that's true. Uh, we think of Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg. There are wonderful examples across the country of people who had an idea pursued that idea and in the process of pursuing success created economic opportunity and jobs uh, for millions of Americans. In my view, that's what we ought to be doing is accelerating the opportunities that all Americans have to pursue the American dream. Uh, and Startup 2.0 is a, uh, an effort to set the stage for that to be the case. The, uh, the basis of our legislation is that we need access to um, capital, we need a regulatory environment that is not restrictive, uh, and we desperately need access to the best and the brightest, the talent. Uh, we often think of that as STEM, but also entrepreneurial individuals 
uh, who have the desire to live and work and create businesses in the United States. Um, our legislation, uh, which um, CES and others have endorsed, uh, and we would welcome your input as we finalize it for introduction uh, this month in its, uh, in its next phase, its next form. Incidentally, it's, a, it's, it's very bipartisan. I sought out uh, Mark Warner, Senator Warner of Virginia, himself an entrepreneur, and he and I became the lead sponsors of the legislation. Senator Rubio and Senator Coons had legislation that they had introduced related to job creation. We uh, picked up some of their ideas and picked up two additional sponsors, and so the four of us have become uh, the champions of this, this legislation. But we want to make changes in the federal regulatory process to lessen the government burden on job creation. We don't need entrepreneurs who have to hire lawyers and increase cost in order to start their businesses. We want to modify the tax code to increase the opportunities for capital formation and for investment in new businesses. Uh, we want to accelerate the commercialization of research that's conducted at universities across the United States. Federal dollars are spent daily in huge amounts uh, on an ongoing basis, and that research uh, we want to make certain is uh, brought to the market and commercial op with commercial opportunities as quickly as possible. And most importantly, as I say, uh, to provide opportunities for highly educated entrepreneurial immigrants to stay in the United States where their talent and new ideas can fuel economic growth and American jobs. We've been told that our legislation is something that could pass if we take out the uh, issues of visas. Uh, at least it would stand a better chance if we would remove the provisions related to entrepreneurial or STEM visas. Uh, and from my perspective, that's the most important piece of this legislation. And um, while I can't predict, uh, and perhaps you all can tell me your ideas, I cannot predict whether or not a broad-based immigration plan legislation would pass this Congress. Um, there is focus, as we know, upon that. Uh, but I would hate to see, once again, that things that we broadly agree upon are never considered because there's a philosophy around here that if you can't do everything, you can't do anything. And I would guess 80 plus percent of my colleagues would agree with me and the provisions of this legislation in regard to allowing folks who are highly educated, who have entrepreneurial skills to remain in the United States and put those skills and their intellect to work. Uh, and yet the only reason that I can see that we can advance that legislation is there are those who want to hold it hostage for other items uh, in an uh, in a, uh, immigration agenda. Uh, and I worry a bit politically that while there's now focus upon uh, immigration issues and an immigration policy, that there may be those who want to use this topic one more time for politics and keep raising the standard by which uh, legislation is satisfactory. And the problem is that while we wait for the political resolution of broad-based immigration, other countries are not waiting. Uh, and we are losing the opportunities for entrepreneurship and those individuals here. Uh, it's uh, not very rare, uh, it occurs regularly that individuals will tell me their story about their education at Stanford or the University of Kansas. Uh, they're they're foreign-born but U.S. educated and they have just a few months remaining on their visa. What can I do to help them to stay here because they have a great idea or they have the, the uh, great skill set that employer wants. Out in, in uh, Silicon Valley, I remember a conversation I had with one of the major uh, firms, uh, companies there, and they were waiting on the decision of uh, 68 uh, H-1B visa decisions. Uh, I didn't say that very well. They were waiting on the decision on 61 visas, H-B-1. Uh, those 68 visas were denied. None of theirs uh, were accepted, uh, failed in the lottery. And the story that sticks with me is that, well, we hired those folks anyway. And I thought, oh my. But then the next part of the sentence was, but we hired them in Toronto. We hired them in Canada. And while 68 jobs is something that our country should not lose, the opportunity to have that employment, what worries me even more is someone, or more than one person of those 68, will be the next innovator in creating a new company that employs thousands of people but they now are located in Canada, not the United States. And while I've only been a member of the United States Senate for a couple of years, in that two-year period of time, seven countries have changed their laws to support entrepreneurship and innovation and to bring people from around the globe to their countries to innovate um, and create 
companies and opportunities there. Chile is, the, is a prime example, and one of the things that stands out to me in the statistics about their uh, efforts to bring entrepreneurs to Chile is that 20% uh, of those entrepreneurs they have recruited to come to their country and to start and grow a business are United States citizens, are Americans. So the American dream is being lived. The American dream is being pursued, but the American dream is being lived and pursued in places outside the United States of America because of our failed policies, our inability as political, uh, in a political sense to resolve issues that our country faces that common sense tells us would help us solve many of the, the uh, country's economic challenges and move us in the right direction of a more balanced budget. Um, my view of why any of us, um, us as American citizens, our primary responsibility, me as an elected official, but no different than any of you or any other American across the country, is to make certain that our future citizens live in a country with freedom and liberty guaranteed by our Constitution, but to be able to pursue the American dream. And uh, it, is, uh, it, it saddens me when I hear that the American dream is being pursued uh, outside the United States, not that I don't want the rest of the world to have that same uh, set of values and goals, but we want to make certain that we're not losing people from our country because we don't have the right policies in place to allow Americans to pursue the American dream in their own country. So I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, I would ask for your help. Uh, Senator Warner, Senator Rubio, Senator Coons and I would love uh, to have the support. I'm going to continue to travel uh, around the country. I'll be back to South by Southwest. I was at CES uh, this year. Uh, I'm fascinated by the uh, new products. It's, a, it's certainly a symbol that uh, great things are happening in our country, that we can be positive. Uh, sometimes uh, in Washington, D.C., and many of you spend much of your time here, uh, it's easy to become pessimistic. Uh, CES was one of those opportunities in which uh, the realization is that there are still great things, great minds, great people at work uh, in our country and around the globe that will help us solve uh, our challenges that we face in the United States and the challenges we face uh, globally and that the future is bright. Uh, we ought to make certain that our governing folks in Washington, D.C. pursue the policies that enhance the opportunities not detract from them. And thank you for your advocacy on, on behalf of those issues and those policies. Thank you all very much for allowing me to join you. There's always one in the audience. At least one. So glad you're here this morning and so glad that you've taken up these issues is something you care about. It's easy to see why Anna Eshoo embraces the issues that Silicon Valley cares about. It's, I think it's more important that people like you understand that it's not just about the tech companies, it's about all the efficiencies that can be realized in manufacturing, in real estate, in retail, in banking. How do we get more people like you? How do we get more senators and congressmen who don't have constituents in the high tech sector to realize that this is about the entire economy. How can we as a community better communicate that to your colleague? Uh, Professor, that's a great compliment. Uh, every politician loves to hear someone say, how can we get more people like you? Uh, it's a very rare occurrence, I would suggest. Um, I thought about mentioning this. Uh, many of you are in government affairs and involved in the political process of Washington, D.C. Uh, you're advocates. You're trying to figure out how to build the coalition for the issues that you care about. I do think I'm an example of someone that you would not predict to come to the United States Senate and be engaged in these issues. Uh, and while we had some interest in my time in the House of Representatives, uh, this really has become a front and center issue for me. Um, and while I'll never walk away from the, the basic uh, issues of Kansas agriculture and energy and the things that uh, the aviation industry, the communications industry and, uh, in our state, those things remain important. Uh, this is something that uh, you would not think that a Kansas uh, senator, a Kansas elected official would engage in. And I would tell you that in, in part, I've described how I got interested in, but the other thing that uh, I think would, would lend itself to finding other people, other senators, other members of the House of Representatives to engage is every state, and Kansas has a great startup community, if you can connect those entrepreneurs, those individuals who have these ideas with their elected officials, uh, it is life-changing. It is certainly uh, occurs to me. Uh, part of our experience in Kansas was that 
Google and the Gigabit arrived in Kansas City. There's a startup, a growing startup community based upon that and other features. Uh, we have uh, angel investing tax credits, and so um, across the prairie, there are opportunities for startups and entrepreneurs. My suggestion to, to you in, in responding to your question is find those entrepreneurs in every member's congressional district, in every senator's state, and put them together. They are fascinating, interesting, enjoyable people, uh, and they will capture their elected officials, and members of Congress will see the opportunity that there is in their states and their districts for economic growth and opportunity for job creation. And uh, there's no politician that doesn't like to cut a ribbon on a new business. Hi, uh, Andrea Peterson from Think Progress, and first off, Rock Shock. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> Jayhawk over here. So it I is, know it is basketball season. <laughs> it is. Uh, are we going to see you at the bottom line this year? I uh, mm, I hope. <laughs> Uh, so I had a question really quickly. You mentioned earlier how you thought that the, the larger immigration debate was slowing down some movement on the Startup Act, but how much do you think that congressional gridlock has led to situations like, like outdated privacy protections like warrantless, uh, excuse me, warrantless inquiry into privacy under the Electronic Freedoms Communication Act of 1986? Well. I think there's a broad question in there about congressional gridlock. It's very discouraging to me. Um, I would t uh, let me say it this way: about half the people who call my office will tell the person who answers the phone, "You tell Senator Moran not to budge one inch." The other half will call and say, "Why can't Senator Moran work with his colleagues and get something done?" And that may differ from state to state. Uh, th that percentage. But we all face those circumstances in which people feel, feel so strongly about an issue they don't want you to budge an inch. And I think both callers, both sets of callers are correct. There's a few things in which you don't budge much, if at all, but there's a large set of issues in which you have great opportunity to work with your colleagues uh, and resolve issues. And your question is, how does, how, what's the impact of the gridlock on privacy issues, and the, the answer is this gridlock is, um, is damaging to a variety of issues in a variety of arenas. And in some fashion, uh, it's incumbent upon us uh, elected officials to find the opportunities for that broad set of issues in which there is give and take, in which there is the ability to find common ground. And so many of the things, again, that, that you're interested in meet that uh, criteria. They would be, the, the, the long list of issues that your agenda includes would be those things that generally are in the arena in which we can find if we find the, if we had the desire, if we had the willingness. And I think there is a real recognition on the part of many of my colleagues in the Senate that this uh, persistence of doing nothing has got to come to an end. It's very discouraging to me, I mean, it, there's nothing in my background that would ever suggest I grew up to be a member of the United States Senate. Uh, having been elected to the United States Senate ought to be this huge thrill, and it, it is. But my interest in being a member of the United States Senate is to accomplish something. Uh, it's to find that common ground and to, to pass legislation, to pursue policies, to have the communications with, the, with those in the administration. Uh, and we need to make certain that, that this president and this Congress, uh, in the broad sense of the issues that uh, our country faces, are willing to sit at the table and resolve differences. Uh, it certainly matters to me personally so that there is a, an enjoyment uh, in being a member of the United States Senate, but it matters desperately to our country and to future Americans uh, in what kind of America they will live in. Thank you all very much for allowing me to join you.